So, uh, next up, Simon Svensson from uh, Sweden will talk about a very painful subject for many of us. <laughs> and uh, I personally hope to learn a lot from him today. Uh, I hope you do too. <laughs> okay. Uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So yes, I will be talking about how to run a LARP and not go broke. And uh, I have come all the way from Sweden, and uh, I belong to an organization called Atropos. I'm going to talk a little about us and a lot about practices. Uh, and here you can see a small little shot from one of our LARPs, a very cheap LARP, as you can see. No rooms, only tape. <laughs> that is one of the keys to not going broke. But I'm also going to talk about how to run a LARP and not break. Because almost anyone can make a profit if they're willing to break. And then you stop making a profit roughly a couple of months later. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, we started a LARP organization back in 2011. We wanted to make weird fantasy LARPs. We wanted to uh, just create, be creative. But in 2017, three of the members of that old organization called ART uh, decided that we wanted to take it to another level. We wanted to do something real, something professional, or at least something bigger. We just had a feeling that we wanted to take it to the next level. Uh, so in late 2017, we got together, three of the members of the organization, and decided to start Atropos, which is one of the Greek goddesses of fate. Uh, the one of cutting threads and dying, which is a very much in theme for uh, <laughs> our LARPs. Uh, our goal was to professionalize and commit to running a LARP organization. At when we started it, we only had this idea of professionalization Professor and blah, 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 yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we didn't really know how or why we wanted to do it. We just knew that we did. So uh, me, I was sort of the driving force behind starting Autobus. Uh, I had mostly run and uh, organized vampire LARPs for many, many, many years. Thirteen years in Gothenburg before that. Uh, but when I found the LARP Monitor Celestra in 2013 and was brought onto the crew there, I learned that this is what I wanted to do. I had been looking for things to do my entire life. I'd gotten a bunch of different educations. But finding that LARP, I realized that sitting in a small bunker behind a computer screen, watching players interact with something we have created was what I wanted to do. And also write way too much in way too little time. These things called to me like they do with any LARP creator. Uh, and I was, in my head, I was like, yes, I will be writing stories. I will be telling stories to people. But it turns out that I would also be doing all economy, marketing, websites, administration, writing characters, <laughs> designing LARPs. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is the story of three people starting an organization. Because Every organization always starts with people. You cannot create an organization in a vacuum or just have an idea about how that organization will work unless you first look at the people who are starting it. Uh, you need to know who they are, if they know themselves, and what they can actually do. Uh, you need to know what they want to do, what they hate doing, and what they can consider doing if they have to. <laughs> because these are the three components of every organization. Like if every, all three people that are starting something hate the same thing, you will need a fourth person. Don't try to make it with those three people then. Like sit down, say, okay, what do we hate? Because that is the most important part. The reason why we worked out well was that I sat down and said, I hate these and these and these things. And my uh, one of the three others, Carl, our scenographer, said, whoa, those are the things I like doing. And I said, well, what do you hate doing? Oh, I hate characters, I hate player interactions, I hate admin, I hate websites. I'm like, that's what I'm doing. That's great. And that was a very good foundation, and I think it's important to remember. Uh, you also need at least one person, hopefully several, that are really driven. At the start, that is the recipe for burnout, unfortunately. Being extremely driven, being willing to do all these things, 
and wanting to succeed are all recipes for burnout. And hopefully, we are going to handle how to avoid some of those things in this talk. But most importantly, you need someone who likes spreadsheets. <laughs> Never create an organization without someone who likes spreadsheets. <laughs> Creativity, all of those things, that can come later. If you don't have this person, give up. <laughs> That's also me, I love spreadsheets. <laughs> all right. Uh, Creating an organization, or this of course works if you already have an organization and you want to sort of start from this again and go through the different steps to make sure that you're not on the way to burnout and then you might want to be become profitable or so on. You can also use these questions, but I'm talking uh, around them as if you're starting an organization from scratch. So the four questions I think everyone should ask themselves is, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? Who do you do it for? And how will you do it? That tiny part, last part there. So I'm going to go through these questions and give a little context to them and uh, hopefully try to help you answer them. Of course, I cannot answer it for you, but you can hopefully get the help to answer them for yourselves. So start off with what do you want to do? Everyone usually has some kind of idea of what they want to do. Uh, these are often on the like fringes of LARP, some people just have the idea, I want to make a LARP organization. But what is that? Is it a company that's supposed to earn money for the people working with it? Is it a non-profit that is designed to make LARPs, but nothing more? You're not supposed to get any value out from it? Is it a campaign LARP? Is it an art festival where people will come and play LARPs? Is it a blockbuster LARP that will be known all over the world and seen on Time magazine? Or is it some performance art where everyone stays in-game for 30 days and no one is allowed to go off-game? We're planning that. <laughs> uh, so that is the very first question you need to ask yourself. Because you might also want to create a groundbreaking LARP experience, something that no one has thought out before. And this is surprisingly common. People have this like, yes, I think we have a unique idea. And then it's very good to know that you're aiming for that because that requires a lot of research. Uh, and the what is a rather simple question. The much more complicated ones come now, because most people that I know of, at least, have some idea. They either want to create a company, or they want to create a nonprofit. Either they want to earn money doing LARPs, or they want to run a lot of LARPs, because they have that creative energy. But why is much more complicated. Identifying the why is necessary to avoid conflicts or unnecessary tension. Because even if four people sit down and say, we all want to create a non-profit LARP organization, that doesn't actually say anything of what those people want out of that organization or why they want to create it, what drives them. Do you want it because you're passionate about LARP as an art form or as a medium, as some people call it? Is it one because you really want to be artists? You want to create, but you never had the discipline to write a book, so you wanted to create a LARP instead. <laughs> Less work, more payout. <laughs> I know you're out there. <laughs> uh, is it because we want to get rich? Change your profession. <laughs> uh, is it because we want to create the best LARP in the world? Or is it because no one else is organizing LARPs? That is also a very common reason to organize LARPs. It's because we want LARPs to be organized. No one is doing it. Now we are. Or is it because you have nothing else to do? Like, I don't have a job. <laughs> I, I'm not good at anything, but I, I know LARP at least. I can do that. Uh, and if you have very different whys, even if you're all like, OK, we want to start a company. But if some person has like, I want to get rich, other people are like, yeah, but no one else is doing it. So I'm, I guess I will be doing it. And another person wants to be an artist. Then you will immediately run into trouble running that organization. And just sitting down and asking, like, why are we doing this? Even if it's been an organization that has been around for six years, that is always a relevant question. Because it can change as well. Maybe you're not doing it for the same reason now as you were when you started. And if you don't know that, tensions will probably arise. Then, 
we have who are you doing it for? And this has been the argument of decades within LARP, but there is no correct answer, but there is an answer for your organization at least. Because who are we creating LARPs for? Are we creating it for ourselves, the people who wanted to write books but never did? We usually create it for ourselves. Do we want to create it for clients if it's a company? That's a very different thing than creating it for players, as we have probably heard a little about. Uh, because then you're creating it on demand. Are you creating it for the players? Are they sort of feel, do they feel ownership over the LARP? As is often the case in Vampire LARPs, for example, or anything that runs over time, players often end up feeling that the LARP is for them. It's not no longer the organizer's vision of a LARP, but it is everyone's LARP. And the organizers are almost doing the community a service by running the LARP. And we certainly had that conflict in our Vampire LARP where people started saying, yeah, you're no longer allowed to make these changes because the LARP belongs to us now. And we were the organizers. And that if you haven't said that out loud from the start, that can become a very, very infected conflict because organizers need energy and they need to want to create something because they are the ones putting in endless hours into this thing just to allow it for people. And they often feel like they're not being appreciated enough that all their hours are not being paid in any way. They're only being paid in getting the LARP done. And then people come and say, wait, you're not allowed to do that because that my character does that or that, or this will change the, the, the game I know. And if you haven't communicated to the players why you are organizing the LARP, this is very easily confused. Then there's the idea of creating it for the community, which is basically, again, a variant of we want LARPs to be made. We want LARPing to happen. We want to be a part of an international or a national community. What can we contribute with? A sort of a mixture between the organizers creating it for themselves, but also players participating because they want to be part of a larger narrative or a larger story. And if you go back to the yourselves, is it because you want to express something, you want to teach people something, or you want to show your art to the world? Or is it because you enjoy the act of organizing? There's many different ways of or organizing a LARP for yourselves. Uh, and some of us definitely come up with visions that we just want people to experience because them experiencing something we made is important. While others mainly want to do it because they enjoy seeing people enjoy themselves and, and play your game. Uh, and once again, as I've stated in the other questions, sitting down and asking yourself this is quite important. Uh, it's often something forgotten because it's almost a bit taboo to say that you're creating a LARP for yourself. Like, it, you're not meant to do that. Despite being the person spending by far the most hours on running this, it's taboo to say, well, I'm doing this for my sake. I want to do this LARP, not a different LARP. I don't want to change these things because this is the LARP I want to run. If you don't want to come, you don't have to come, but this is the LARP I'm making. Instead, we are expected to change the LARP in order to suit the players, no matter, or at least that's my, have been my experience a lot. If they give feedback and you don't agree with it, you are the one doing something wrong, rather than saying, you know, Yes, your feedback is great if I wanted that LARP, but I don't, I want this LARP. And being honest about that to yourselves is important. It's not bad or wrong to want to run a LARP for your vision. And if no one wants to come, uh, sure, then they didn't want that kind of vision. Then don't run the LARP. But you have the right, at least, to listen to yourself and do what you want to do. And I think that's something also that causes a lot of burnout because we feel this pressure as organizers to conform to like, oh, but if the players want that, maybe we should change it to become that. And it slowly slides from something we really wanted to do and something we were passionate about to something that is a duty or an obligation to do to people that we don't even feel really appreciate what we wanted to do in the first place. So uh, ask yourself. And then the tiny point of how will we do all this? And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the end of it. Uh, I don't have any answers. No, <laughs> I leave that up to you. No, I have I have plenty of answers. I, I'm just here to create problems and then leave you.
<laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> so uh, I have five different points for uh, how will you do it. But first, I'm going to take off my jacket. <laughs> this is now turned into a speech slash striptease. That's correct. This is the first. You can. I, no. <laughs> no, you strip these because it's warm, because you couldn't afford air conditioning. <laughs> okay. Uh, so <laughs> there's five points here money, which basically is financing, pretty self explanatory. Audience is a mix of like marketing and who will play it, basically. You cannot create a LARP unless you actually have people who want to play the LARP, unless it's a very, very tiny LARP. And then you won't make number one. So <laughs> here we will sort of assume that you want to create an organization that will be able to run fairly big LARPs that can actually make money and that has an audience. There are certainly ways of running tiny art LARPs without basically any cash at all, but this is not a talk about those. Then there's location and how that impacts the calculation. Uh, then there's administration, because you realize as soon as you start making any kind of money, the administration grows tenfold. No kidding. Like We went from having maybe fi 50 small things to do every year to uh, last year we had you know, maybe 2,000 receipts and something like that, just to, just for the accounting. It grows exponentially as soon as you start having any kind of money. And then the last part, creativity. like The parts that actually create the vision of the LARP and what kind of LARPs you want to run. What time is it now? Great. And now we have summoned Malak, the demon lord. <laughs> Money, audience, location, administration, creativity, Malak. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> Very good. I've uh, made not only one but two jokes. One of them I didn't know about. <laughs> No, this is definitely an asshole thing to handle. So. <laughs> so, when it comes to money, uh, this is something that also causes a lot of tension and that you absolutely need to decide before you start trying to earn the money. Like, what is your goal with your LARP when it comes to making money? Is it to make the best LARP possible? and still earn money? Is it to make the cheapest LARPs possible, like accessible to the most people, and still not go broke? Is it to make the easiest LARP for yourselves? Like, we want money so we can like survive and have fun making LARPs, because that's also a very like, legitimate thing to do, uh, which is, is using the money to simply simplify your own processes. Is it to make the most profitable LARP? Don't do this. Then you will have people buying cooler clothes for $10 and stuff like that. Microtransactions in LARP, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely, uh, it's, it's a question you have to ask yourself. Uh, because, mm, actually, ignore that. Uh, because if we don't know what kind of like organization we want to run, the money will go to the wrong things. Because there's also, once again, speaking about taboos here, there's a certain expectation of LARP organizers to always use the money to make the best and cheapest LARP. As soon as you start using money, for example, to make it easier on yourselves, some people will almost always complain that, okay, is my money now going to your hotel stay? Is my money now going to you having food? <laughs> Why not me having food? <laughs> and it's important to be prepared for that conversation. Because if you just see it as one LARP at a time, then it might be a legitimate one. Like, if you're just making one project, then yes, should you really get that hotel stay and the car that you wanted and so on? But as soon as you go into sustainability, 
as soon as you want to be able to run LARPs the next year as well, and the year after that, you need to be able to tell your players that these things are investments into your sanity and actually making sure they have more LARPs to play in the future. Because yes, you can make one super cheap, super great LARP. And these are often the LARPs everyone has heard about, like that enormous LARP with 100 people that was so amazing and everyone got burnt out doing it and it was so great. But yes, but you cannot make that LARP except every other five years or so. And no one in that group will make LARPs again. But yes, you can make a super great, super cheap LARP if you're willing to burn out and like never want to make LARPs again. But you need to be able to tell people, we're doing it to make it easy on ourselves. And that was our goal when we started org our organization. Make many LARPs as easy as possible with as little mental or financial pain as possible. And you should always repeat the mantra, you should never pay to organize LARPs. You should never have to pay from your own money to organize LARPs. That should be the very baseline of organizing. And it might not be possible, but that should still be what you're aiming for. So, in order to figure out how to make this possible, we need to know what do LARPers actually pay for. Because it's a well-known fact, or a fairly known fact, LARPers do not pay for the things that cost money. <laughs> LARPers pay for what they think something is worth, judging from how it looks, how cool people say it is, if it has a cool location. They don't at all pay for things like every, you, each participant gets a pair of grey pants. That is super expensive to buy, and no one is willing to pay the money it's worth. Like, what? Ticket is 30 euros more expensive because I get a pair of grey pants? That seems like a useless LARP. But that's how much it costs to give everyone a pair of grey pants. And that is, those are the sort of things you need to be aware of as an organizer. Because sometimes you have great ideas that people are not willing to pay for. And sometimes you have really bad ideas that people are willing to pay for. And you need to identify these things. Uh, and location is usually the one thing that can make people pay more than the LARP actually costs. Uh, and this might feel like a shameful thing if you're not trying to run a profit. But remember, you are going to make it easy for yourselves. And in order to do that, you cannot just make the cheapest LARP. You have to have some kind of surplus so you don't die. So identifying what people will pay for is important. That also allows you to run the other LARPs, the LARP that you had a dream about, but people were not willing to pay for what that LARP would cost. Well, luckily they're willing to pay more for this other LARP. And then you can use that money to run the LARP that you wanted to run, that your vision was about, but no one wanted to pay for. And this is especially true for international audiences where people have more money, as we spoke about yesterday. So especially when you want to attract international LARPers where a lot of more money is on the, suddenly on the field. This is, becomes even more important, but because international LARPers can look at a hundred different LARPs, and they have to say, like, oh, this is worth my money, even if it has nothing to do with what that LARP costs to organize. Uh, and this brings us to audience. <laughs> Once you have identified a couple of things that uh, people are willing to pay for, and I'm happy to talk about this like afterwards as well, uh, you need to decide, like, okay, what is our audience? Because they pay for different things. Like, is our audience other LARPers? Is it adults who are not LARPers? Are we trying to do, like, a team building LARPs and stuff like that? Is it children? Is it a specific subset of LARPers? Are we just, do we want vampire LARPers? We want people with a certain knowledge. Or do we want a certain fandom? Here, there's money here. <laughs> <laughs> if you just identify them in time. <laughs> There's a lot of money, because they're willing to pay for a LARP that didn't exist before. But as soon as the market is saturated with the fandom LARPs, then suddenly it becomes all the more difficult to get people for those. Uh, but without knowing your audience, you cannot make a LARP that is priced in a way that people will pay. For example, if you know that it's a subset of LARPers, then, for example, vampire LARPers might identify things in a vampire LARP that is cool and different, because they know what other LARPs are offering, and what you are offering. But if you're targeting a vampire LARP to, for example, international LARPers, then they look at it and go, is this something that is worth going for? What makes this vampire LARP different from other vampire LARPs? They are different audiences and will pay for different things. Is it about, about this? Yeah. 
so the question is, if what if, what if it's two different kinds, like both a fandom and both and LARPers? Well, then you are probably hitting a jackpot, especially if the fandom has not been like catered to before, because then they both know what what LARPs actually cost, and they're willing, hopefully, willing to pay it. But they also know that their fandom is not represented. But it can also run into the problem of them being LARPers means that they know about all the other LARPs about that fandom. And then they can suddenly look at different ones and, and compare them. Uh, but this is something you need to identify. Another thing that on the checklist of knowing your audience. Location. I have a very bad uh, part of myself. And it is that I cannot design a LARP if I haven't seen a location. Uh, some people write LARPs and then they go looking for a location. I need a location first before I can even write a pitch. Uh, and some people can do both. But it's very important to know because some people say like, oh, do you have a great LARP idea? And when you sit down for a meeting, everyone goes like, oh, I don't really have an idea. Then go out and find locations first and then start creating LARPs. And it's a small part of the my mantra that I have, uh, in order to make LARPs profitable, you need to stop spending energy on LARPs that are not being made. Stop writing LARPs that will never have an audience. Stop writing LARPs that don't have a location. Start writing LARPs where you already have a location. And start writing LARPs where you already have the possibility of running it. Write a pitch, see if people are interested in it, get the location, and if it seems like the LARP will sell, then you design the LARP. Then you put in your hours, because your hours are was valuable as a LARP designer. Especially if you're trying to make a profit. Because those hours could be spent making something that can actually have people coming to your LARP. I've seen people spend a year making their dream project, and finally finding a location, and they release the tickets, and they've spent hundreds of hours on this, and no one signs up. Not only is it soul crushing, and you will lose all hope in your own, like in yourself as a designer. But you've also spent a lot of hours, like real working hours, on something that never will never happen. Get the t even we even release tickets before we create the LARP. We have an idea, we get a location, we release tickets, then we design the LARP. And people pay for locations, not for experiences. <laughs> Then we come to the A in Malak. <laughs> Administration, and this is the real devil here. Uh, you will soon realize that there's a lot of things that no one does in an organization. And that no one does them means that someone will have to do them. And if you haven't decided who that someone is, and they have volunteered to do it, you will hate each other sooner. They will hate you. Uh, because all of these things that everyone thinks like, yeah, that's not my area that becomes someone's area. Make sure that all these areas are covered, all the things that is involved in administration. It can be even things like who answers emails, who answers things on Facebook, who like goes in and explains something when your organization is tagged somewhere, who does these very simple things, who checks if someone had got, got their payment. Is it the economist? Is it the administrator? Who sends in that paper that was lying on someone's floor? Someone will have to do it. Make sure that you've decided who does it instead of letting the person that picks up the trash from everyone else does it because that person will burn out first and your friendship will be over. Hopefully not, but it might be. We've seen it happen. So, uh, there's one way of doing it, it's the right way. It's do things properly from the start, or end up like us, which is also a valid alternative. We manage to survive all these bad errors. But if you have the chance of doing it properly from the start, do that. Otherwise, you will have to figure it out as you go along, including doing two years of accounting after the fact. <laughs> Don't do that. And then, creativity. You just have to create the LARP. <laughs> yes. How much time do I have? Yep. Great. Because luckily, I have some words here as well. So a mantra.
Orchestra again. I, I like these little short, uh, powerful things. Create things. When you're creating a LARP, you should ask yourself, is it better, is it different, or is it new? At least if you want to, once again, this is the, under the assumption that you want a LARP organization that is running some kind of profit that you can use to make things easier and so on. Because if you're just making exactly the same as someone else, it's a very slim chance that it will grow an audience, that you will become, that you will expand the organization. You will, might get a couple of LARPers, the ones that do, don't want to travel to the other thing, they might travel to your thing because it's closer, it's easier, and so on. But if you really want to expand an audience and expand your organization, you need to be either better or different or new. And it's perfectly valid to look at a LARP and say, we like this LARP that was made in Germany or in Sweden or in Spain. We just want to do it as well and give it a chance for people to come here. If you do, be honest about it, write to the organizers and say, we're going to make a LARP inspired by your LARP. Is that okay? Can we run it? This is our idea. But it is also perfectly valid to take something that you liked and make it better. Uh, we have sort of almost specialized in this. We go to a LARP and we see, oh, I really like this original concept, but what if we did not have magic at this LARP? Wouldn't that be a much better LARP? And then we run that instead. <laughs> or, like, hmm, College of Wizardry without magic. That sounds like a much better LARP. <laughs> that is uh, forbidden history that we're running this, <laughs> this winter <laughs> again. Or, hmm, this LARP seems great, but what if it was more historical? Better. And then we run that. Uh, once again, it's always nice being honest about these things. Not that you're doing it better, because people don't like that. But at least that you're doing it differently. So if you can do both better in your own eyes and different, you can start having an audience because people will see, oh, they seem inspired by this, but they have a new twist on it and it seems even more worked through. Wonderful, we are willing to travel for that. We're willing to spend money for that just for the chance that it might be something that I liked, but better or different in a way that I liked it. Like then you have found a niche audience or the most difficult of them all, new. Everyone has the hope of like, creating this new thing, especially people who wanted to be fantasy authors. They have this dream of creating this LARP that is like, ah, oh, imagine they just step into this world and it's all new and they will have to learn everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? That's not a selling point. <laughs> no one likes a LARP that has like, yes, just read these 30 pages about world info, then you can create a peasant. So start off like, if you want to make that LARP, and this is just a small uh, lesson that, I, uh, that we learned, start off extremely small. No world info except like a couple of lines that inspires people. Get them LARPing there and then push the world info on them after two or three LARPs in that setting. Then like, don't you want to know more? <laughs> or if you have a really cool location, you can ignore all that and demand that everyone reads 50 pages of fiction. Lotka <laughs> Voltero. Uh, so yeah, once again, location can make up for almost anything. If you have like a 2,000 square meter bunker, then you're good. Ask people to read material. <laughs> uh, we might not have get to rent it again. <laughs> <laughs> we did. <laughs> so in order to create LARPs, these are some general tips that we have assembled. and. Uh, just to, again, to give some perspective, we started our organization in 2017 with zero money. And we had 10 lead lights. That's what we had in, in terms of investments. We, we followed many of these advices. We, were, we wanted to create LARPs for ourselves. We wanted to create LARPs that we believed in. And many of these general tips are from our perspective. It might not work for you, but it's what worked for us. And in two years, through analyzing an audience, trying to make LARPs that did not exist before, but it was still our vision. We didn't try to cater to the players. We saw something that hadn't been done that we wanted to make, that we were passionate about, and we made it. And we have gone from, at the end of 2017, we had nothing. And right now, just a month ago or a couple of weeks ago, our organization just invested in a brand new eco car for uh, 20,000 euros or something like that. 
just to make the organization even more smoother and easier in the future. And we were honest with this to our players. There were sponsor tickets that people could pay that basically said, if you pay this, you just give us more money to do good things with. And that's about being honest again about what you're trying to do here. Like we have built up uh, storage with lots and lots of tech. All of these things that we have bought, like buying a car, buying technology, buying sonography, buying a storage or like hiring a storage, all of this is both lowering prices, but it's also making it easier on us to run LARPs and it's making sure that we don't burn out as fast. And it's really, really important to be honest that these are the things you do because otherwise there will always be suspicion among people what, what the money is going to and so on. Be open and upfront and you will usually receive support. So be honest about yourselves. Why do I want to do things? Where does the money go? What is our long-term goal? Where do, you want to see, where do you see yourselves? Be ruthless about these things. Don't start compromising about the things that you really want to do. The moment you start making things only for other people or only because you think you need to do it and so on, that's the moment when you will start losing the energy to make your own LARPs. If the entire group doesn't want something, get someone else from the outside who wants to do that thing and let someone have a break and not be part of that project. And this is our little speciality called only darlings design. Everyone will tell you like in these professional settings, oh, you need to kill your darlings, you need to kill your darlings, only do the boring stuff that people want. Fuck that. Only do darlings, because it's great. Do LARPs that entirely consist of the things you wanted to do the most. Spend inordinate amounts of time on them. They're not worth it at all. But for real, sometimes to make a LARP that is just the stupid great ideas that you wanted to do. If no one comes, then so be it. At least you got to do the thing that you had always dreamed of doing, instead of always pushing that to the side and always cutting the things that you really wanted to do. It's your time, and sometimes, but not often, you can spend that time wasting it on things that you really want to do, but it might not be profitable. Remember that. Do it your way. And this is another point of criticism that people often get, and I, especially me. I usually call myself like a crazy dictator in our LARPs. Like I will go in and I will reserve the right to have a veto over almost everything. I want to, I want to be able to change things last minute. I'm a horrible boss. I'm a horrible coworker sometimes. Better coworker than boss. But I have a vision and something I want to create and I have a lot of drive. That does not mean that I think that I'm the best. Just because I only know how to make things my way, and I want to make them my way, does not mean that I think that my way is automatically better than other people's. Even if I go into an organization and say, yes, I want to make this my way, no other way, this is my vision, I want to make that. That does not mean that all the other visions are bad. And when people come to cr with criticism and say, uh, you should probably change that, I say, I don't want to change that. That's not the same thing as th saying my way is the best. It just means that that's how I work. And being honest with how you work and your own quirks and how square we might be in our visions, that's okay. Because you can be both humble and say, I want to do it my way. You can say that, yes, I will try to improve my LARP, but I will do it under my circumstances and my way of doing it. And sometimes that is what is required in order to dare make that LARP that you've always wanted to make, to feel that it's okay to do it your way. And then, ignore feedback. <laughs> At least feedback that doesn't align with your goals. This is super important. If you go into a feedback document or start collecting feedback without knowing what kind of LARP you're making, you will immediately be soul crushed by hearing of all the irrelevant shit that people are giving you as feedback. Because they will tell you all sorts of things that they thought was bad from their perspective of how they would make a LARP. They're not telling it from, what do I think that you want to create in a LARP? How, to make the, how can I make that better? They're telling you, I didn't like this. Here's feedback saying it was objectively bad that you did this thing in your LARP. And that feedback is not good for you. Only look at feedback that are improving the things that you want to accomplish with your LARP. Oh, here's an idea that would actually make our vision better. That feedback we can take in. And we have started first looking at quantitative feedback, which is like how many people enjoyed the LARP. Some LARPs have 95% people who enjoyed it, and yet you find these essays about how horrible it was objectively. 
because when people write things in words, it's very different from how they actually enjoyed things. Learn to ignore feedback when it's not supporting your vision, but it's breaking it down or changing it entirely to something you didn't want. Yeah, and uh, that's the end. Do we have time for any questions at all? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, are we done with your presentation? Yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, we have like uh, 10 minutes for questions, and uh, here's the first hand in the air. So, of course, uh, I imagine that you didn't just, you know, work your way through it. So did you have any inspirations, people that helped you, books, uh, websites that you learned from, anything in particular? Um, I think that what helped us the most was a social network of things like this, like uh, going to conferences and talking to individuals that had done it before. Uh, of course, nowadays, there's this great book that is having its reprint soon uh, called LARP Design uh, that has a lot of these collected wisdoms in it. Uh, but I think that the, the thing that probably helped us the most was realizing that, that we could listen to ourselves. The, it's a bit of a weird anecdote, but the first LARP we did that was after a crash and a burn and almost burnout was a lot we didn't think would get any people. We made a tiny Blade Runner LARP. It was like we launched it on a Friday Friday evening, and we thought that we would get maybe like 20 people who. And the LARP said it was about eating noodles in the rain. That was <laughs> like the main story of the LARP. And on Saturday morning, we wake up and like, holy shit! Not only is it full, it's like three times the amount of max spots that we had. And we, that's when I started thinking about, okay, we found a niche. We found a group of LARPers that had an interest that was not being sated anywhere. There were no LARPs like that that we could find. And that was what started me thinking about, oh, here's market analysis to be done. Thank you very much. Um, I was interested, there are many ways to gather feedback. And how are you, uh, not to gather feedback, but... Uh, uh, inform your players about things because many times you said be honest and tell them what you're doing and how do you do it? Um, we use a combination. Most of our like uh, ideology pieces where we explain why we have made decisions and so on, that is done on our Facebook page. But that can only really be done after you've gathered a certain amount of people to the Facebook page. Uh, before that, I usually prefer it uh, either talking to people at the LARPs or having it as part of your like introduction material to a certain LARP, like w our vision with this LARP is, and then you also include like our organization is hoping to. Another great place to have it is in pricing section, where you explain why are these prices the way they are, that can be put where people read about how much the LARP costs, because that's where everyone will go and try to find out how much it costs to LARP it. Of course, there's a uh, whole lot of other practical parts about creating the LARP. So this is very much about how to build the organization that can then start off doing all these things. It means that it rescues you from pitfalls and mistakes that will burn you out or will make you go broke early on. But how to design LARPs that people want, that's a very different question. Uh, on the topic of fandom LARPs, uh, do you have like any suggestions how to get around copyright? <laughs> yes. Uh, it entirely depends on what fandom you're dealing with as well. Like, uh, first thing is to read up on the internet how harsh that fandom has been in being struck down. Like, uh, go to Reddit, go to Google, and just try like copyright issues, this and this fam fandom. That's the very first thing you should do because then you can see like, are they putting down every fanfic? Are they uh, taking down every image about that fandom and so on? Uh, if they're not doing that, then usually you can create LARPs doing the inspired by and a series of different things. Never just one, because then they think it's just a hidden LARP of that thing. You go, we for example put, uh, this is a LARP inspired by Blade Runner, by uh, Cyberpunk, whatever the year name is, uh, by um, New Romancer, by like a series of different things that were all contributing. And uh, that means that no, they cannot point at one single thing and say, oh, look, there's a copy of this. We can say no, because that was also in that book, and so on. And also having a person that reads up on the law, like this administrative person that gets to do everything no one else wants to do. Make sure that person also does law. <laughs> 
Good. Uh, I want to ask what percentage of the income you make from the labs do you think should be reinvested to make uh, the next one and uh, back and what should be kept basically as a, as a minimum profit if you want to make any profit? Are, we, are you talking about if you want salary or actually living by the LARP or just uh, if you're running a non-profit because it's very different? Y if you're running for profit, how much do you think should be reinvested that percentage to the next? Uh uh, we calculated that in order to, uh, it, dep it depends on how many people you want to give a salary to, of course. But our, our organization with five people, for it, in order to have two people that were salaried and uh, worked with the economy and administration, for example, we counted that roughly 50% of a LARP's revenue needs to be profit. Around 20% of those went to for future investments into the, the company in terms of things or, or tech and so on, and 30% went to salary for the people who work for us. Yep. Anyone else? I'm actually also answering the question, working with LARP, uh, since we get salaries for everything, also the creative parts and everything, not just the administrative part, I would say for what we, uh, I'm just, I mean, I make LARPs for non-LARPers, but if I just look at our economy overall, 80% of like, or ex our expenses are just salaries. So that's like the main salary, like ours, shit loads of expensive. It's, that's what people don't think about when they want to create LARPs uh, for profit because it's so, they say, well, I just put five more hours into fixing these characters. I'm like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> Do you get that back from changing those three lines? Is it worth, like, yeah, it becomes a totally different situation. But you're also an organization that cannot invest in stuff as much as we can. Yeah. Like, uh, because you don't run production LARPs, so you, yeah. yeah. So it d entirely depends on how much you need to cheapen the next LARP. Like, if you can invest all of your profits from the first LARP into making the next two LARPs cheaper to run, then it might be profitable to do that. And then we waited two years before we started sal uh, giving salaries to people uh, because we wanted to build up a cheap way of organizing LARPs because otherwise we would go into the red immediately, basically. How do you how do you decide upon the future investments? Like like you in invest in tech that might not be relevant. I don't know in a few years, but but like that's like one problem with tech. Or you invest in in uh, costumes that you m might use only for one LARP. And yeah, I mean that's the question. How do you decide upon the investment? Number one, rerun LARPs. Once you've built a LARP. And the, all the stuff for it, run it again if it's full. Like if it filled out for the first time, run it again. Two, invest in old tech. Like for real, many of the LARP needs don't need new tech. Invest in stuff that has worked for 10 years already and you're much better off than you are in investing in new, the newest applications or the newest stuff. How do you deal with, let's say, you have this one person who wants to play in a certain way, but you know that that would be either destructive for other players or it just does not fit within what you have in mind? How do you tell them you can't do this because it's going to be horrible for other players without actually hurting them or getting them to play anyway, but without actually hurting anyone's feelings? That sort of, yep. I'm sure if you understand what I'm Yeah, I, I understand it perfectly. Number one, you need to ask yourself, do you need this person? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like for real. Here, here. Because <laughs> a lot of the time, if you're looking at, do we want to care about this person having the LARP they want or our organization and, and, and organizers being mentally healthy? <laughs> the question is always mentally healthy and kick that person. Uh, but if you need that person for money, you're in a very tough situation. Or if you need it because they have a lot of friends. I realize it's not always so black and white. Uh, but you should always ask yourself, like, yes, it might be okay to tolerate this person, this LARP. But will we tolerate them two years into this and we've still not handled them? Then it might be the right thing to actually tell them that you are not welcome now. And we have, like, sometimes you just have to do that. It's not fun, but... If they don't understand it, always talk to people first. Try to be honest about what the problem is. And if they 
don't seem to understand what it is that you're saying, then ask, tell them that this is not the LARP for you. Don't say you're doing it wrong, you're a ro the wrong kind of LARPer, or you're a bad LARPer, and so on. Say, our vision does not work with your way of LARPing. And you, unless you want to change that, you're not welcome at our LARP. Make it about your vision, not about them as a person. That's my only... <laughs> Hi, so could you elaborate a bit more on the ignore feedback tip? Because it seems like a good way to run yourself into the ground. Like you push your way and the audience pushes their way. And in the end, no one, no one reaches a compromise. No one reaches a goal that they wish to be done well. They, no one reaches a positive experience, let's say. Uh, that's just how ignoring feedback that does align with you sounds to me. Well, I think it's a lot about uh, will people still show up? Like That's the always the core concept here. Uh, and if you're making a LARP and the people who are coming there are not happy with that LARP you, that you're making, but you still want to make that LARP, see if you can find people somewhere else before you start changing your own LARP. If you don't have people that want to come to your LARP, then you need to ask yourself the tough questions. Because sometimes you have to realize, like, my idea is a bad one. No one wants to come to it. And then you cannot make that into a profitable idea. But if your idea is still attracting people, but some of those people are the wrong people, once again, quantitative feedback is the, the one where you should start. If 80% of people are having a good LARP, but 20% are saying that it's objectively bad, then you need to probably to ignore the 20% if they are like saying things that go completely against what you want from your LARP. Because 80% are having a great LARP. Then you need to find other people to fill those 20% slots. Yeah, exactly. But they are saying that it's objectively bad. They write that this thing you're doing is wrong. But yes, exactly. They, they are, yes. Uh, Definitely, but constructive means that they're building on something that you want to make. For example, if you're making a vampire LARP and someone says, I think your vampire vision could be better if you did this and this, then they're building with your vision. But if they say, I think we should have more werewolves in the vampire LARP, it sucks that you're doing a LARP about vampires. <laughs> and, uh, exactly, and that's what I mean. Like, we, we constantly get that kind, but more subtle. Like, oh, I think the vampire LARP you're doing is wrong in these and these ways. And what they're saying is like, a LARP that you don't want to make, then you need to not feel like your LARP is bad when they write that. You need to say, well, this is not the LARP for you, because we want to make a vampire LARP. We don't want to make a very werewolf LARP. That's very simplified, but that, that's the essence of the ignoring feedback, because some feedback is simply that they want a different LARP than what they're going to. And people do that because they don't have that many choices. They're like, oh, I've always wanted a werewolf LARP, but all I have is a vampire LARP. Oh, I guess I send in that it's a shitty LARP every time I give feedback. It's like, oh, still a shitty vampire LARP. More <laughs> werewolves. Uh, okay, I'm going to cut this short now. Uh, Simon will be here today and tomorrow, so you can just, you know, buy him, him beer and um, pepper him with questions. <laughs> I love talking about <laughs> <laughs> Here's your cup. To rem remember this. Uh. <laughs> Bye. Okay.